hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm here to talk about designers and gaslighting. First, I actually want to talk with you about these small people. Uh, that is me on the left, and when I was a kid, I was incredibly jealous of my older brother. He was two years older than me, he still is, and <laughs> turns out that's how math works. Um, but the thing is about my older brother is that everything seemed like it came really easy to him. He excelled at school, he skipped the fifth grade, he had perfect grades. His teachers loved him, and my dad talked him up all the time. I wanted that praise so badly, I could taste it. And so what I did is I decided to do whatever it took to get it. So if he started learning algebra in the seventh grade, I would learn it in the sixth grade. And if he read a certain book in the ninth grade, I would pick it up in the seventh grade. And then when everybody started praising him and congratulating him for the scores he got on the SATs, which are our big um, college entrance type exams in the United States, I locked his exact score into my memory and thought, I will need to know this later when I take this test. Now, two years later, it's time for me to take my own. And I only had one goal, better than him. How much better didn't matter, better than him. So I took the SATs. And I will tell you, I actually think the SATs are a very problematic test. I do not have time today to talk about why. I no longer believe that they should even be given. But at the time, this was the most important thing I could imagine. I wanted so badly to get approval and acceptance through this. And so, I took the test and I waited. And because this was the year 2000, my scores did not come to my email address because I didn't have one. My, uh, maybe I did, don't remember. My scores, I couldn't look them up online. I had to wait for them to come in the mail. And at the time, we lived down this little road in Oregon. So a tiny little gravel road, and you had to walk all the way up to the end of it to get your mail. And I remember the day that I walked to the end of that gravel road, I get my scores, I finally show up. And so, of course, what do I do? I tear them open on the way back to the house. And I pull them out. And I gasp. Because I'd done it. Not by a lot. My scores don't really matter. But I was elated. Because I had scored just a little bit higher than my brother. So I walk into the house. And I am just bursting. And I tell my dad. I say to my dad, I did it got my SAT scores, and I tell him what they were. And do you know what he said? He said to me, that's pretty good. That's almost as good as your brother. I was crushed. The first thing that I tried to do was correct him. I said, no, 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 don't you remember? And I told him exactly the scores my brother had gotten, because unlike my father, I had burned them into my memory. <laughs> and he told me, no, 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 that can't be right. You must have forgotten. All that work, all of that time I had spent tracking every little detail and trying so hard to measure up. And it still wasn't enough. And that is when it hit me. The truth was, it didn't matter. It had never mattered. See, the thing is, I had grown up believing in the back of my mind that I was the problem. That the reason I was not getting that praise, and the reason I was not getting the same kind of feedback, the same kind of acknowledgement, was because I just wasn't as good as he was. I had not measured up in some way. I was insufficient. And so I spent years trying to fill that gap, like literal years, taking every advanced course I could take, doing every extra credit assignment I could, being on the top of my class. And then it was crystal clear. There was nothing I could have done. There was nothing I could have done because you cannot prove your value to someone who is intent on not seeing it. And so what I did, finally, was stop trying. I let it go. My brother became a scientist. He's a renowned professor, he's very smart, and his research is really cool. He works on alternative energy projects as a material scientist. I'm really proud of him. I didn't want any of that. I studied language and journalism. I built my career in UX and content strategy. And you know, honestly, that career has been pretty good. 
think I wrote books, I gave talks. And then eventually what I actually did is I evolved my work into what I do now, which is coaching, training, and leadership skills and communication dynamics for teams in tech and design. And I did that because what I started seeing, even before the pandemic, were so many designers who were burned out, who were disillusioned, who were feeling this incredible amount of imposter syndrome, who were feeling overwhelmed with this idea that somehow they were not measuring up. I heard so many conversations like this that I actually stopped working on design projects because I felt like the most helpful thing I could do or the thing that was calling me the most was actually to work with these people. And so one of the interesting things about offering coaching is that I end up working one-on-one -on -one with people when they're in really dark times. I have so many conversations where people tell me things that they haven't told anybody else. They tell me how they feel stuck, how they're struggling. And so they work, when we work together, they tell me the things that aren't their highlights, not their promotions, not the LinkedIn stuff. They tell me about all of the ways that they feel like no matter what they do, they are not being valued in their organizations. They tell me things that sounded really, really familiar to me. They say things like, well, my organization just doesn't understand research, so I need to prove my value by working even harder. They tell me that they spent two years evangelizing content design in their org, and people still never invite them to the meetings. Or they tell me that, you know, they're stretched across five teams, all these different product areas, and yet they're told design can't get more headcount until they demonstrate impact. And then I wasn't just hearing it in my coaching sessions, I also started noticing it out in the wild. Some of you may have read this, it was uh, making the rounds earlier this summer from Jed Anton, who had been a UX research leader at Meta and an Airbnb. And he wrote this post um, earlier in the summer about how there's this UX research reckoning. And in that post, he says that UX research, as it has existed over the last 15 years, hasn't done enough to justify itself. Or I started talking about this on LinkedIn and started getting lots of comments, many of them people saying like, yes, yes, I've seen this. But then I'd always get a comment something like this. Well, if UX designers can't demonstrate their value to their leadership, they're failing. End of story. This person also called me pathetic. It was a really good day for me. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. I heard this stuff over and over again, and there was a really clear message. And the message that I heard over and over was just do more. Oh, and by the way, if that doesn't work, you weren't doing enough. I started noticing that this felt a lot like gaslighting. I don't know if you've seen the movie Gaslight, but it is where the term comes from, and Ingrid Bergman plays a young wife whose husband slowly manipulates her into believing that she is losing her mind. Because she keeps seeing their gaslights in their house flicker. And he keeps telling her she's imagining things. But not only are they flickering, he is the one who is making them flicker. And that's what I see here. Designers told over and over again that what they're experiencing, being left out, understaffed, unvalued, isn't happening. That the problem is them not showing enough value, not trying hard enough. But what I found is that the problems are real and they're often created by the same leaders who deny that they exist. And so, what I'm here today to talk about is something that I had to learn very much the hard way, which is that you cannot overwork yourself into being valued, and you cannot explain your way into being valued, and you cannot fight your way into being valued. Because you cannot prove your value to someone who isn't interested in seeing it. And it is a recipe for burnout to try. Because there's never enough that you can do to make somebody care about you when they've decided not to. And so my question today is what happens when we stop? What happens when we stop spending our one wild and precious life on an unwinnable game? And for a lot of people, that feels really terrifying to say, what if I stopped working all of the hours and saying yes to every project? It feels like a kind of thing that's gonna ruin their career. But what I started doing is I started thinking about this and talking about this, started hearing from people who said, I changed that in my approach and here's what happened. And so I interviewed a bunch of them, and they're going to show up in this talk today, because they have to sort of found a way forward 
that allows them to have a little bit more space from some of these messages and get back to doing some of the things they actually like or care about within design. So as a result of those conversations, I zoomed out, and what I found is that there are three reframes that I think we really need to make if you are feeling any of these feelings I've been talking about so far. And those three frames are around the way we look at our time, the way that we look at our value, and the way that we look at our relationships. These reframes are designed to help you break out of that gaslighting cycle. They may or may not change your organization. I'll talk about that later. But what they do is they change our relationship to the work. And in some ways, they may even make the work more successful. So we can talk about each of those. Our time. So what I hear oftentimes being said to designers are these things. We need you to do more with less. When I hear that one, my eye twitch starts. I had an eye twitch for like four months of 2020. I don't know why. You could guess. And it comes back when I hear do more with less. Um, oh, always be helpful. Never miss an opportunity to demonstrate your value. Oh, and you need to stretch across that full product surface area until we get more headcount. Here's the thing. When we listen to those messages, do you know what actually happens? It's not more respect. It's not that magical seat at the table. It's actually a lot of overwork and martyrdom. Because where we end up is feeling like everything is our personal responsibility. We end up doing shallow and unsatisfying work because it turns out you don't have time to do better work. And then all those product partners or all of those cross-functional teams or all of those clients, what they expect of design is shallow work because that's all they've ever seen. If you're stretched out across all these different areas, what are you going to do? Are you Are going to do deep work? No. And then you know what happens? Our organizations don't change because guess what? Why would they add headcount? Everything sure seems to be covered by you, stretched out, exhausted. So the reframe I'm talking about around time is going from a place of saying, you know, we're understaffed, so my time has to be stretched. I've got to spread myself across everything. And instead to move to a place where we say, we are understaffed, so my time is precious. I need to protect it for the most high value work that exists. I want you to really think about this and really kind of let this sit with you. Your energy is a scarce and precious resource. There is only so much of it. There is only so much of each of us. And when we start to see our energy as scarce and precious, we start changing some of the ways we show up to the work that we do. One of them is to stop saving the day. I know so many people who get that little bit, that little hit of validation by showing up and being like, oh, you didn't invite me? Oh, you. You forgot about this whole part of the work? Oh, don't worry. I mean, yes, invite me sooner next time, but I'm going to work all night. I will work all weekend. I will show up and I will fix this. And here's the thing. When we do that, what actually happens is that we get taught that, that saying yes and showing up and always being that helper, it's going to make us valuable. But as Dylan Wilbanks, as a senior design manager, told me, he stopped doing this. He said what he found is that that's a trap because you get into this kind of heroism. You actually have more value if you do fewer things better. You can actually demonstrate that value better to your organization if you do fewer things. And so when we chronically save the day, what ends up happening, though, is that what should be our organization's pain, the pain of understaffing, the pain of underplanning, the pain of undervaluing design, we turn that into our personal pain. We make that our problem to fix. So what I encourage you to think about is what happens if your organization feels the pain of its choices instead of you having to take on that pain? What happens if sometimes things drop, things don't launch, because you didn't jump in and fix it? I talked to Melanie Seibert about this, who is a UX manager, and she said, you know, what was really hard for her was saying no, being able to say no because she had this belief that if she said no, someone might say she wasn't doing her job. This is what I hired you for. I had the expectation that you were going to cover eight products and you're not doing that. But she said what she found was that actually never happened. That was her fear, but she never got that feedback. And so once you can start saying no to some things, you know what you get to do? You can start finding the actual juicy design work that you probably got into this field to do. So a juicy problem 
deep work, that's what gives a lot of us meaning. Like, we don't like to go paper, well, maybe some of you do. I don't know your lives. I don't want to go paper over things with a little bit of sprinkle of design. I want to get in and solve an actual problem. And so juicy problems, deep work, that gives us meaning. It also gives us a dark screen. Huh. No idea? Great. They also give us more memorable case studies, meaning it's easier to talk about the work we're doing in compelling terms when we stop taking on everybody else's stuff and actually do the deep work that matters. Melanie again. One of the things she said was try and experiment. I asked her what advice she would give to people. This is it. Try and experiment. What if you drop some of those things? Spend more of your time on solving one problem. One problem area where um, you could really sink your teeth in. It's going to be rewarding to most people, and it's a good object lesson to everyone around us to say, look at what this person can deliver. This person can deliver a lot of value if we give them the right working conditions. But we don't get those stories if we keep running around and saving the day. And because of that, there's going to be some gaps. There's some stuff you're not doing anymore. And so one of the things that I absolutely heard over and over in the interviews that I did was to make those gaps visible and then don't fill them. Again, let people see the work that's not happening, the work that's not happening because you are not going to stretch yourself across eight products or 17 projects or whatever is happening in your org. I talked to Aladrian Goods about this, who is a senior content design manager, and she said, you know, they have done this thing that they call zone coverage, where everything in a pillar is going through this one person. And the impulse is to spread that person out across all of that work. What they did instead is they decided that they were going to get really clear on the subcategories of work and call out the gaps in red, all the things that that person was not doing. Here's all the areas we are not working on right now. Oh, you want those to be worked on? Yeah, us too. We all want those to be worked on. How would we solve that problem? And it becomes a problem that isn't being solved with this one individual's body. She said it was taking her personal responsibility out of the work getting done and holding the organization accountable. Michaela Hackner, who is the global head of UX Ops uh, at Indeed, she talked about how she made a really similar decision. They published their 2023 commitments, and then what they do is they update them every quarter. And so if her boss ultimately says, hey, I need your team to, to do this, she'll just say, well, take a look at this list, which of these things do you want us to not do? These are hard conversations. These are not easy conversations to start having, especially if you're really used to saying yes. But I want you to think about what is the work that is worth your precious time and energy? What is the work that is actually important for you specifically to be doing? So the second reframe I want to talk about is our value. How do we think about the value that we bring into our workplaces? What designers often hear are things like this. If you want that seat at the table, you need to prove the value of design. If you want to be invited earlier, you need to make a case for why. And people don't understand what you do, so why don't you make a deck to evangelize your practice to the org? Everybody loves those decks, right? Here's what happens. When we follow that advice, we often end up in a defensive place where we're justifying our existence. And you know what that does? Is it makes design something that is up for debate, as if like, we can just like debate back and forth. Is it valuable? Is it not valuable? And then guess what? We still don't have impact, because um, the more time you spend explaining why design is valuable, the less time you spend actually designing anything. And so I talked to Anna Suderbaum, who works on localization and UX writing. It was a manager of UX writing at a startup. And she said that, you know, we create so much imposter syndrome for ourselves when we always try to prove our value. We end up in this stress cycle thinking, OK, have I proven myself enough? Is this enough? And my experience coaching people is that they get this in their heads, and it's never enough. There is never that moment where they hit enough. And so the reframe that I want you all to think about today, reframe of our value, is going from a place of saying, OK, design isn't well understood, so what I need to do is to prove my value. I need to create yet another deck, go on yet another road show. I need to do more so that people know that I'm valuable and my work is valuable. I look at that a little differently. I say design needs to own its value. It's not up for debate. 
It exists. You know it and I know it, or you wouldn't bother coming to a conference like this. So I need to assume that I belong, and I need to bring a strong perspective with me. And so that looks like a few things. And the first is to ask for curiosity from our partners, from our colleagues, but not validation. So when we get caught in this place of seeking validation, meaning I need you to tell me I am valuable, I need you to tell me I am worth something, then you get caught in the cycle of needing to continually do more to get that validation. I don't feel valuable yet, so I'll go do more to make myself valuable. And you still stay in that cycle, where you can never quite feel that sense of value on your own. And so what we need to do is we need to actually ask people not to approve of our existence, because like we exist, design is here. What we need people to do is actually engage with our ideas. What we need to be asking them to do is to actually get curious about the work that we're doing and let go of the idea of like getting them to tell us that we're valuable and just get them to work with us on the ideas that we have. And as part of that, we have to stop explaining ourselves so much. I've seen this a thousand times. Decks, roadshows, all about what design is and why someone should care, what UX research is and how you can work with us, what content design is and why it matters. We share the double diamonds. And you know what? No one cares. I'm not saying no. I mean, some of us might care about those tools. Some of us might care about those definitions. But a lot of those presentations, they fall totally flat. Nobody listens. People forget about it. And it doesn't change their behavior. They might nod along. They might say, that sounds good. But does it actually shift the way that they run the next feature or product launch? No, they tune it out because it's just more information. It's more stuff. And so I talked to uh, Jonathan McFadden, who is a senior content designer, about this. One of the things that he said he was going to do in his org is stop making any of these decks. They just stopped. And he said one of the reasons he had a um, conversation with his manager around a big round of layoffs that had happened the previous year. This is at Shopify. And his manager said something that he said really floored him, but actually changed his perspective. If there's a discipline that has to spend such a disproportionate amount of time proving why it's important, it's probably not going to be considered important to the business. Meaning, all of that time saying, I'm valuable, I'm valuable, I'm valuable, is not time on the work. Which means, when they're making decisions around something like layoffs, they're going to go, oh, this is not, this is not really that essential to the work. So what do we do instead? I think what we need to do is show up a lot more boldly in the work. Bring a stronger point of view. One of the things I've noticed recently is there's a lot of designers out there who have gotten into a place where they're spending a lot of time just walking through comps or walking through Figma files, walking through flows, and here's a UI detail, and here's a UI detail, and here's a UI detail, but not necessarily bringing a strong point of view. Why that? How did you get there? Why is that the most important solution? Why did you pick that over something else? So often, what people are not really doing is they're not really showing up with a lot of um, confidence in the ideas that they're bringing. And Jonathan had this point that I thought was really valuable here. Because I think the education stuff, like here's what design is, it's comfortable. We often feel shy about showing up in the work. Because showing up in the work itself, there's more risk in it. And by risk, what I'm talking about here is that people might not agree with you. When you put an idea out there, a strong perspective, they might think, you're prioritizing the wrong thing. They might think, hmm, I've never thought of it that way. They might think, I don't really want to follow that advice. But guess what? If you don't put that idea out there, you're certainly not going to change anybody's mind. And so when we shy away from that risk, what we end up doing is we really cut off the power of design because we're not telling people about it. So what I want you to really think about is, what is the perspective that you bring to the work that nobody else has? and share it with conviction. I often see people give their design presentations through a lens that's very like subservient, which is like, please approve of this. Please approve of this. And they show that to their product manager, their design partners. And if that is the message you're sending, please approve of this. Then that keeps you in this relationship of subservience, as opposed to a relationship of strength. Where you're saying, this is what I bring, this is what I know, and this is why I believe in this work. One of the things that Aladrian said to me was that she really got into a place of encouraging her team to start setting the meetings. And I've also seen this a lot, where people are afraid to say, you know what, 
We haven't talked about this. I want to flag it. I think it's going to be an issue. I've set a meeting up. Here are the goals of it. Please come. But there's a sort of like hanging back and waiting because it's sort of like we haven't been told that we're important enough. And I want you to all know you are important enough. So if you have a question, if there's something you see that's missing, maybe it's time to set up that meeting. Maybe it's time to kind of put yourself out there and say, I can be a lead on this without permission. I want you to really think, what is missing from the work when you are not there? Because there is something missing when you are not in that work. There's a perspective missing. There's things that would go out the door that could cause harm to people. So what's missing when you are not there? Because that is truly the value that you have, and no one can take it away from you. No one needs to validate it either. It exists, and I just want you to own that, and I want you to own that as boldly as possible. And finally, I want to talk about our relationships, the relationships that we have with the people that we work with. So it's not just with designers here, but because of all these things designers here, I also see designers tell each other some stuff that really worries me. I see them talk about how, you know, like product managers, they don't care about design, they just want to ship features, cross-functional partners, they see us as pixel pushers. We have to fight back against all those people who don't respect us. And I understand how we get to that place, but here's the thing. That mentality, that gets us us versus them thinking, meaning we see enemies instead of any kind of shared humanity. And it gets us a lot of exhaustion. We're constantly preparing for a fight. Do you know how much it takes out of your body, like physically, to be in fight mode all the time? Like part of the reason I see so many designers who are burnt out is that they are perpetually stressed and ready for conflict. But when your body is in fight or flight mode all day and your central nervous system is activated, you are going to exhaust yourself. We can't live like that. And guess what? We also feel a lack of belonging because when you close yourself off from your colleagues and you see them as like the other, what you end up doing is feeling even more disconnected and alienated. And so, the reframe that I want us to take here is to really go from a place where we say, oh, well, I feel misunderstood, so therefore, I need to fight the people who don't value us. And instead, move to a place where I need to say, okay, I feel misunderstood, I need to build relationships. Because if I show up in a place of constant battle, I'm going to harm myself, and I'm sure as hell not going to make friends who want to work with me. But if I show up from a place where I really expect that the people I work with are imperfect, and they also want to feel valued, it's like a human thing, we all actually want that, then I can move to a place where maybe I can connect with some people. And I don't control the part about whether our partners actually like, show up in the same way. They may or may not. But the thing that we can change is the way we are showing up. And to do that, I think we need to do a few things. And I think the first one is to stop assuming it is personal. Maybe it is, sometimes it is, but often it is not. And in fact, the times when we are most likely to take things personally are when we feel insecure. When we don't feel totally confident in ourselves, we start assuming other people's behavior is about us. I don't know if you've ever been like wearing an outfit you feel self-conscious about and you think everybody's looking at you and whispering about you. You know what? They're probably not. They don't really, people don't care that much. But you get that in your head because you feel insecure. And so in reality, oftentimes, these things that we um, start thinking is really personal isn't. Like when people don't invite us to meetings. What Anna said about this is that, you know, people are not leaving you out because they don't want you to be there you specifically to be there, or even design specifically. They're often just not thinking about it, or they haven't realized they need you, and it's not because you're not important. The way she looked at it is like, it just is sometimes. Sometimes it just is like that. Sometimes it do be that way. And it is good to just kind of have some distance and be like, sometimes that's how it goes. And it doesn't make it right, and it doesn't mean something you have to like. You can dislike it, you can feel a little bit upset about it, sure. But when you start seeing it as personal, whew, that is going to take it out of you because it's going to turn into that us versus them. And we have to drop that because if we show up with an adversarial tone with the people who should be our partners, we are not going to have a good day at work, we're not going to do good design, and we're not going to change our organizations. So I talked to Michaela about this. One of the things she said is she used to find herself like leaning forward in meetings in this most aggressive stance. And when she was leaning forward like that, she was just ready to fight. And the more that she found herself kind of sitting back, 
getting into this more managed nervous system, trusting herself, what she found was that it really changed everything about the conversations she was in and the way people responded to her. Because again, if you show up in fight mode, you know what you're going to do? You're going to encourage everybody else to show up in fight mode. And now what you have is a fight. And once we're not being adversarial, the thing that we can actually do is we can get curious about the people that we work with. And it's really disappointing sometimes when I see designers really incurious about the people they're working with. Because again, you can have all sorts of criticism of other fields and their priorities, but they're ultimately people that you're working with. So what would happen if you got more curious about the pressures that your PM faces? What is going to help them get their promotion or keep them from it? What's the stuff that keeps them up at night? Who's going to scream at them if you tell them that this thing isn't going to be done in time? Again, it doesn't mean you have to take on all the work and say yes to them, but can we have a little bit of interest and maybe even a smidge of compassion for those people? One of the things that Michaela said to me that really stuck out was this idea that if we spent the same amount of time trying to understand our partners and what they care about as we spend trying to understand our users, we could actually paint a better picture for everyone, which is this is what we can do together. This is what we can actually do when we all come together in this work. Ultimately, the best way to get someone to actually see things your way is when you first give it a shot to see it their way. And we haven't skipped that step. Sort of like, I don't have to do that part. You have to see it my way, or else you don't care about design. But when have I actually really tried to see it your way? When do I try to sort of step into the PM's shoes, step into maybe those like cross-functional partner's shoes, marketing's shoes? What is happening over there? Ultimately, I think that when we start connecting with our partners instead of fighting them, that is actually the best chance we have of doing better work, feeling less stressed out, and actually reminding ourselves and everybody around us that this is a workplace full of humans. And that in fact, we need each other and we need to see each other as allies against some greater missions than just fighting one another about a project. Because ultimately, your value is not something that can actually be debated. The value of design is not something that is up for debate because I know, I know it's valuable and you know it's valuable. There's nothing to prove. It exists whether or not the people around you see it. And so, if you hear people say that this is how designers are going to succeed, by constantly justifying themselves and doing more and more and more, I really want you to know that that is the gaslighting. That is designed to make you question your own reality, which is that you know design matters already. That is not the way forward. It is not the way that's actually going to change our organizations. In fact, what it does is it creates a universe where you start believing that maybe it is all your fault. Maybe you haven't done enough. And guess what? You keep working, you keep working, you're stressed, you're mad, everything's a fight, but you keep working until you crash. And I've seen so many people crash the past few years, and I don't want us all to experience that. Because see, the thing is, if proving yourself and justifying yourself and making those decks, if that was going to work, it would have worked already. Like how many of those decks do you have to make before you say like, hmm, maybe this is not the way forward. And so instead of doing that until you get cynical and until you start resenting everybody around you, what if we change the way we approach things? The thing is, when we buy into this kind of gaslighting, because this is not just in your head, you do receive these messages in design that this is what you're supposed to do. But when we buy into those messages, what we end up prioritizing is being liked over simply doing the work. And the problem with prioritizing being liked or being wanted is that it constantly leaves us in the lurch. It's never enough. Constantly feeling like you have to do more. But the goal is not actually to be liked. I mean, not by like a corporation. Corporations can't actually like you, you know. They're not people, despite what some people in my country seem to think. I live in the US. <laughs> um, but when, when we prioritize being liked, we actually don't end up with the validation we seek. We end up feeling less and less good about ourselves because we never quite get enough. And we continue to turn structural problems into personal failings. Meaning we start to believe that the only thing in our way is us, but it's not. Do you know what's in a lot of our ways? Business structures that are inhumane at their very core. 
a system that prioritizes shareholders and investors over everyone else, short-term thinking, profit-seeking, unbridled capitalism, those are the real things in our way. And there is no managing up that you can do that will change that truth. I love this post from Erica Hall um, earlier this summer where she talked about how many researchers were getting laid off and she wanted to dispel some notions about it. And I think we can extend this to anybody associated with design. She said, you know, researchers aren't getting laid off because they didn't do a good job proving their value to business. It's that they were hired into organizations that either didn't actually have reality-based business models and or have been doing short-term investor-centered design instead of anything resembling evidence-based strategy. In other words, you cannot prove your value to someone whose business model relies on not seeing it. And I think this is actually where I disagree with Cynthia from yesterday, where she said that, you know, the executive conversation doesn't need to change, you do. Oh, I think business needs to change. I think business needs to change quite a lot. Because the reality is, like, late-stage capitalism means that a lot of us, in a lot of countries, are working for companies where the business model is fundamentally misaligned with a good user experience. Shareholders and investors are actually the only audience that really matters when you get down to it. I want that to be dismantled. I think it's destroying the earth. I think it's destroying us. But here's the thing. It does us no favors as designers who care about people to pretend that that model doesn't exist. To close our eyes and our ears to the reality of what our companies care about. Yes, we all need to understand business, because when we don't understand business, we don't really understand what is happening in our organizations and why they're making the inhumane choices that they're making. But we cannot prove our value to a business that fundamentally does not care about the greatest things we have to offer. So again, what if we stopped? What if we look at all that energy that we've been spending? All that energy on the decks and all that energy on convincing, all that energy on trying to like prove value over and over again. And we took that energy and we actually took it back. And we said, what if we spent it on our own well-being? What if we spent it on ourselves and setting some boundaries? What if we spent it on collective action? On coming together with the people that we work with and building stronger internal networks of people who are saying, like, wait a second, I'm not going to do this anymore. What if we unionize our workplaces? What if we spend our time treating our colleagues like people, like actually just saying, you know what, we're all in this mess together. The least I can do is treat you like a human. Because here's the thing, I don't know if your company's going to change. It might not. But I know that nothing is going to change if we keep breaking ourselves trying. And with that, thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was, uh, I feel very inspired. <laughs> also, kind of unsure of myself. Ooh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a question here from Felix. Um, while the value of designers is often not seen or properly understood, they keep getting hired and the domain is growing. How does that fit together with, uh, in your opinion slash experience? Well, yeah, I mean, I think on the one hand, it's growing, but it's also because like an overall sector is growing. And proportionally, we all know that the design teams are not growing at the rates of other parts of the organization. And I'm not saying that like you should have like a one-to-one -one design engineer ratio or anything like that that doesn't actually work for building stuff. But I think we have to look at like, how is it growing in relationship to other things? And I also think we have to look at like, who is getting laid off? Um, and I think that, if I, what I know is everybody I talk to, and I'm sure, no, maybe not everybody, I'm going to say vast majority of people I talk to, and I talk to a lot of people about their inner work lives, vast majority of them tell me it's like the same message. It's understaffed, under-resourced, we are always assigned to too many different things. So my take is sort of like, I mean, you could say like, they're not actually, like, we don't need more designers, or it is growing and that's fine, except it's an unsustainable workload. So maybe then it's like, we sh maybe we shouldn't be doing a lot of the work that is happening in a company. And like, actually, I would totally agree with that. A lot of organizations are involved in a whole lot of projects that don't have a lot of value. Um,
but I think the idea of like fundamentally, I think the biggest thing is about the overwork and the sort of being spread too thin. Um, I've I've been uh, actually I've taken business strategy courses, <laughs> um, and they they say basically uh, if you want to change the organization, then you have to get into the executive suite basically. So learn how how do you respond to that? Well, I think that is true, and. I think that you also have to think about who do you have to become to get into the executive suite and is that a person you want to be? That's, that's a good answer. <laughs> um, there's a question from Yaeli. This was the coaching session I needed today. <laughs> it's not a you. question, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's, there's, I saw another one from Chris. Um, could it be we don't know how to show boldly because we are caught up in our get validation traps? Correct. Yes. Um, I, no, I think this is a real thing. It's like, if you spend your time going like, is, is this good enough now? Is, is, how about this? Is this good enough now? Which I think is really easy to get into because sometimes you're, you're, it's not just, again, this is not just because like each of you is individually like, bad at having confidence. It's because there's a lot of systematic powers at play that are designed to kind of erode that confidence. And I think we have to reclaim it anyway to say like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to this story that's about like, go seek validation, go seek validation. But when you do that, you get locked in this place where it's like, the validation that you seek is very like people pleasing oriented, which means you put it on the other party's terms. Meaning you can only be valued in a way that they know how to value you, and if they don't understand the depth of what you do, then they are not gonna be able to value you in the way that you'd actually like. So it's like really unsatisfying. I look at it as like um, a sugar rush of external validation. A sugar rush is fine. You can have a piece of candy, great, no shame in that, but it's not gonna make you feel good for like the entire evening, right? Like you probably need a meal at some point. Okay. Like, you gotta get some protein in there. <laughs> okay, same thing, it's like those little hits of like, oh, I got like, a, I got like a, a positive response, I got a little gold star. They make us feel good, but it doesn't last. And I think what we really need to look at is, how do we start to validate ourselves in ways that are more meaningful for the long term? Um, one more question here um, from Chris again. Any advice on how to get the people to engage with our ideas? Um, I think this is a hard one. So here's the thing, okay. One of the things I talk about a lot is like, what is in your control, what is not in your control? Things that are in your control, how am I showing up, what am I bringing to the conversation, am I open to other people's perspectives, am I curious about them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things I do not control, the other party. So if the other party is closed off, if you're talking with somebody who is, they are in a config place, like you do not decide whether or not they're gonna be open to you and you can't really control it. What you can say is, what are the things I can do? And the best things I think you can do, you can seek to understand that audience and to really understand them as people and to say what's important to them, where are the pressures they're facing, what's hard for them, and respect those things. Because again, being alive is hard. Like everybody has challenges. And so just saying, okay, can I understand those things? And can I communicate with them in ways that are respectful of sort of the expertise they bring? Can I bring that openness to the conversation? And can I show up boldly with my point of view in a way that is not just shutting theirs down? And if I do that, that's my best chance of being heard. And then you have to accept that sometimes people won't hear you and that's not on you. Like that's the part where you have to be able to say, it goes that way sometimes and I gotta let that go because that's not mine to fix. Like if somebody is closed off to you or they refuse to see you differently, again, you can spend all of your life being like, well maybe if I do this, maybe if I do that. Again, it's like, maybe if I just ace one more test, it doesn't work that way. Thank you. Thank you. Give Sarah a round of applause, people. <laughs>